Yes, ladies and gentlemen, as has been um, announced, uh, I'm a theoretical physicist. And my daily work is about pondering about the most mysterious secrets hidden deeply inside the atom, such as the electroweak forces that you all heard about. And um, uh, it is often rather frustrating that these very uh, deep ideas about the atom have only very indirect impact on our society. This in big contrast with the past. In the past, nuclear energy has transformed our world, transformed our world nearly beyond recognition. So uh, whether you, whatever you think about nuclear energy, it is an important phenomenon, an uh, important feature of our world. The enormous amounts of energy hidden inside the nucleus were discovered by theoretical physicists who were pondering about space, time, and matter. So naturally, one likes to think also, what does our science, how does that transform your, uh, society in the more distant future? Now, this has been answered, these questions, in many different ways by the authors of science fiction. And they display the most lovely uh, uh, ideas of fantasy, and the worlds that they picture are very amusing, and uh, it's lovely to read about, but also very unscientific. These people are not scientists at all. They couldn't be, because if they were real scientists, then uh, the ideas uh, they have about the future would be impossible. They would see immediately, this can't really happen. So whatever they say, you should not believe that, for instance, um, transportation faster than the speed of light will be possible somehow or other. Uh, actually, I think that transportation of humans will never be possible with velocities bigger than maybe a couple of hundred kilometers per second, which is tremendously fast, but probably nothing can go faster than that. Um, and no teletransportation. So uh, uh, the famous phrase, beam me up, Scotty, in Star Trek, that's not going to work. I know I have fellow scientists who say, well, maybe, you know, we can beam up a single atom if you want to. But that's not really the same thing as beaming up a person. So I don't think that is going to happen. It's not part of our science. Uh, a certainly, what is certainly not a part of our science is paranormal phenomena and uh, the use of paranormal effects, whatever they are, for communication, for instance. So some science fiction authors want to communicate with distant stars, the only way to do that is by having some signals go faster than light. Well, there are no signals going faster to, than light, so that's the end of that, unfortunately. So the laws of nature are really forbidding, and now the question is, what can one do? So um, I think that what one can do actually is still amazing, and uh, that is something to ponder about. So suppose we believe the laws of nature that we have discovered today are true, and there's very good reason to believe that, then what will it possibly be that you can do? What will space colonization, for instance, be like? And uh, I've written a lot about that in my little book, Playing with Planets, about which I was not supposed to make any advertisement. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, yes, there, there are lots of things are possible and lots of things are definitely not possible. Uh, for instance, in science fiction books, you often hear about black holes. Now, uh, or a black hole or something like a wormhole, the space warp. Again, Star Trek, you see the, the, ent the spaceship enterprise, whatever it's called, it goes into some sort of, of, of wormhole, some strange tunnel in space time, and then in, in a question of hours, it reaches the other side of the universe, or something like that. And some scientists think that, well, you, for that you need curvature of space-time. And yes, space and time are curved. Einstein has showed that. And we've all seen the physical observations uh, experiments that vindicate Einstein. It's right, there is curvature of space-time. So maybe one can make a we can forge a wormhole in the universe to go to other parts of our universe, some way or other. The only thing that makes such a wormhole is a black hole. And I just, yesterday even, I, I talked to, a, to an astronomer who explained to me there are indeed hundreds of millions of black holes probably in our galaxy. So they are everywhere, so why not find one, jump into it, and hopefully you, you'll emerge in, out of some other wormhole and you, you can travel along the galaxy that way. 
Unfortunately, it's not going to work. I've studied black holes in all sorts of ways and found that they are extremely dangerous objects. You want to stay away from them. <laughs> if you ever would come close, you'll be torn to pieces long before you can enter into one. And if you could enter into one, you would certainly not re-emerge out of another black hole. You'll be <laughs> lost forever. And in fact, you'll die long before you come close to that black hole. So it's not going to be possible, unfortunately. And actually, many people are very negative about the conventional way to go into outer space. Lift off Earth in a rocket ship. Well, if you see these pictures, the natural reaction you all have isn't that an enormous waste of energy. This thing here, the space shuttle, emits enormous amounts of hot gases uh, down as far as, as hard as it can with very energetic engines, and that gives it lift up. Lift up. Wouldn't, shouldn't there be much better ways to get into outer space? And isn't this an enormous waste of energy? Well, I've done some calculations, and actually there's a little surprise here. This is not so inefficient at all. If you calculate how much energy is actually needed to, for us to launch a satellite into outer space, or even more interesting, to launch humans into outer space, to put a human on the moon. You can just calculate, no matter how you transport a human person to the moon, how much energy would that cost? The total amount of energy is not so much less than what is actually being wasted here. It's not wasted at all. Actually, I think that this will be the way to transport humans for a long time to come. There won't be anything better. People are dreaming about the space elevator, just have a long cable and lift someone up. Wouldn't that be more efficient? It would be if such a cable could be made, but today's science doesn't or not yet allow it. It might be possible in the more distant future, but even so, the amount of energy you would waste would not be much less than this. So if you think that that saves the world from energy, it doesn't work that well at all. So um, how will actually space colonization take place? It's a very interesting question. Many people have been dreaming about it, and so have I. There's a very interesting society, in, particularly in the United States, many Americans who are lobbying for space flight. Of course, they have all sorts of ideal ideas in their heads about going to Mars and other places to set up human colonies far in the universe. And they're actually powerful. They are donating fairly large amounts of money to, for, to NASA, for instance, to, uh, uh, to help them uh, realize their dreams. But what these people often think about is Mars. So Mars is very much at the center of their, um, their interest. What if you could send people to Mars and back and, and send them for a longer time to Mars or even establish a human colony on Mars? So they are very much um, lobbying for the American Mars program, send humans to Mars. Well, I have a problem with this. First of all, I'm very worried that this program will be successful and then fail, just like the Apollo program of the Americans when they went to the moon in the 1960s. We've all seen that. During a decade, the moon program was being developed uh, as uh, President Kennedy had promised at the time. Americans land on the moon, they go back to Earth, they go again to the moon, they go back to Earth, and this was repeated about 10 times, and then all money was out, enthusiasm had disappeared, uh, interest in the moon had disappeared, there's no human colony on the moon, and the moon is still empty until today. So the program in that respect was a failure. They didn't establish a permanent human presence on the moon. And so I think the same thing will happen to Mars. You send a crew to Mars, they'll stay there, maybe for a year, then go back, send another crew, stay there for some time and go back. But it will be impossible this way to establish a permanent human presence on Mars. And this is what I would like to dream about, the possibilities of going to Mars. And then uh, or, or set up a colony there and ex have the human race really expand in the universe. Actually, the, the observation I want to make is that you can expand not only to Mars, but there's an entire solar system with very many interesting planets. Unfortunately, the heaviest planets of those, like Jupiter and Uranus and Saturn, they are too large and uh, too violent. You can't go there as a human being. But these things have enormous numbers of moons. Uh, 
the Earth has one moon, but Jupiter has a whole ha has four major moons and then many smaller ones. Uh, Saturn has a large number of of, of moons as well. So uh, there's lots of these little moons, and uh, they are very suitable for human settlement. In principle, you can go there. And uh, the next picture shows you some of the various moons that uh, uh, that uh, spaceships have been. Uh, visiting from close, and they made beautiful pictures. The Earth's moon you recognize at the top left, but there are other moons, Jupiter, Saturn has a whole sequence of beautiful moons, but the other planets as well. Those can all be reached. They have no atmosphere, and they are very cold usually. Most of them have very low temperatures, but that doesn't matter. You can make a, um, a big solid dome with thick glass walls, or even walls of ice if the moon is very cold, and you can generate an atmosphere underneath and heat it to any temperature you like to set up living quarters. This is an exciting possibility that I've been dreaming about, and uh, what would come out of that, we simply don't know. Uh, you can go as far as Pluto or even further. There are dwarf planets way beyond Pluto as well. They're all, in principle, suitable for human um, settlements. So this is a, an exciting possibility that I like to dream about. So um, in this respect, there are very many uh, interesting things. And uh, I hope that one day these dreams will be realized. How will they re realize? Well, that is going to be a difficult question. Uh, I believe, for instance, that one has to send robots first. And I have a very important uh, uh, role for robots to be played. Right now, most of space exploration is done by robots, but those robots are still very stupid machines. They're still dating from the 20th century. I'm talking about 21st century robots, which will be very different from the ones you have using now. They'll be essentially intelligent. And this is a... Oh, I, I should have mentioned this is the moon. This is a, a, a hotel which I've designed on the moon. It's a... Uh, hotel for, for rich people who want to have a vacation there. Uh, on the foreground, you see here a dome for, uh, made by the pioneers who went to the moon first and have settled small living quarters there. At the background is a big hotel. It's revolving around this vertical axis. So at the edges of it, you find ordinary Earth gravity. Near the center, you have the moon gravity. And you can have swimming pools in there to experience different grades of, of gravity and uh, just have a, a nice time out there. Anyway, um, <laughs> the next topic I want to briefly mention is the topic of computers and intelligence. I mentioned robots and I mentioned intelligent robots. Uh, I want to go much further. I'm claiming that what we've seen up till now of information and communication technology isn't anything like what will be possible in the future. In the future, there will be much, much more possible, and this will be extremely exciting. I claim that the information era, which came after the industrial era, has only just begun, and much, much more will be possible. And this is uh, fantastic, the number of things that will be possible in the not-so-distant future. Um, for instance, right now, you've seen the television the personal computer, the mobile phones, the iPods, and so on and so forth. You ain't seen nothing yet. There will be much, much more of that. Your iPods, they'll become essentially intelligent. You can address them as a human, and they'll react to you like a human being and not, not like something that you have to punch in, and every typing error is being, uh, is being uh, punished off. That's not the way... Uh, the, the, intelligent computers of the future will work. And the reason for that is that there's still an enormous uh, amount of scaling possible. That's the so-called Moore's Law. Moore's Law tells us that computer technology in general, from the very beginning of the computer era up till now, has always magnified by factor 10 every six years or so. Which means that six years ago, our computers were, had 10 times less memory than they have today. And six years before that, again, 10 times less memory. And this might continue. And now I'm looking at ordinary science. I'm asking, what will be the limit? The limit will be when the, the distinct elements of a computer will reach atomic sizes. That will be the fundamental limit. But if you then calculate how far can we go, this will easily continue for another 50 years 
or maybe even a century, until you really reach Avogadro's number, 10 to the power 23 atoms in a gram or so. And um, that, uh, that would be the limit of computer memories, much, much more than computers contain today. So uh, when that happens, Imagine what you can do with computers, which are a million times more powerful than those you have today. Those computers will have memories much, much bigger than a human memory, and uh, it's now the task of the software writers to make software for that. That will be a tremendously complicated problem. So I think there will be an enormous amount of software industry, much more than today, to just to handle those enormous capacities that you maybe have in the future. Not only make computer games, but make really intelligent computers. So the computers will take over uh, the world, essentially. Um, today, even science fiction authors don't have that amount of fantasy. They think that computers will be stupid, they will be uh, arguing in a straightforward manner, unlike humans. I believe that computers will be like humans, or more so. They'll have a, a sense of consciousness which is deeper than that of ordinary human beings. And I guess, I don't know how long this will take. This may take another 50 years, maybe 100 years, I don't know, but something like this is going to happen. And this is indeed a frightening prophecy. I don't believe computers will take over the world, anything like that. That's not going to happen, simply because we don't endow our computers with biological features. They don't have desires the way humans have that. But a human equipped with such an intelligent computer will be very powerful indeed, and those are the guys you might have to be afraid of. So, um, so human intelligence in computers is possible, and um, finally, I also believe that um, this, the topic of space exploration that I talked about before, uh, for that topic, intelligent computers will be indispensable. We first want the robots to go there, to these other places. The robots will build a place where humans can live, and then the humans will come, not the other way around. Today, we see the robots are already exploring most of the solar system. There's one robot today traveling all the way to Pluto and look at that planet from close. So yes, we eventually uh, be, will be present in the entire solar system. Of course, you can ask, we are present in the solar system, uh, will we ever be able to reach the stars? Now, this is a problem. As I said, you, the stars are extremely far away, and to go there, you need at least to go with velocities close to the speed of light. I don't believe that will ever be possible for humans, just because the laws of nature are too forbidding. Let alone, of course, you can't go faster than light, but even with velocities close to the speed of light is not possible, not only with today's technology. I don't think it will ever be possible. And that means that humans will always take thousands and thousands of years to go to the stars. So that won't happen soon. So um, humans of flesh and blood, that's really out of the question. However, our robots will be able to make such a jump. For robots, you just let them go there and uh, spend thousands of years to go to this is star, and then when they arrive, they wake up and uh, do whatever their job is near these stars. And this way, human presence can slowly but surely uh, expand across perhaps the entire galaxy. This is something, uh, you know, an exciting prospect I like to dream about. But of course, I'm talking about a very, very distant future in this particular case. So, um, so for this, we need intelligent robots, and this is, of course, a topic which I call spin-off. The spin-off of, uh, of, of this work will be that uh, uh, to uh, explore space in a at a distance, we need uh, computerized intelligence. And once you have that, the computerized intelligence can also transform our world and solve the problems, man-made problems, on the Earth itself. So eventually, everything will come to the better. I think the world will be in the distant future will be quite different from our world, but not the way science fiction authors usually present to you. My time is over. I see all these zeros on the screen. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>